As of Wednesday evening, December 10th, 2025, an invisible river of moisture flowing above the Pacific has turned into a real river on the ground. A powerful atmospheric river is blasting western Washington with a record-breaking 1.27 inches of precipitable water dumping 4 to 5 inches of rain on the Cascades and Olympics and nearly an inch on the lowlands in less than 24 hours. Forecasters warn that at least 18 major rivers are now in or about to reach major flood stage, with crest forecasts to rise 4 to 5 feet above any previous record. Officials estimate that up to 100,000 people in the state could face evacuation orders before dawn. In Skagit County alone, more than 70 head of cattle and 67 acres of farmland have already been moved to higher ground, and a Level 3 evacuation order is now in effect for thousands of residents along the Skagit River floodplain. These numbers are more than abstractions. By 5 p.m., the atmospheric river had knocked out power to nearly 400 Bellingham residents, forced the closure of two medical clinics and several county courts, and shut down parks, bridges, and sections of Interstate 5. At least 18 people have already been rescued from rising waters along the Yakima Nachis and Sky Comish rivers, and authorities have deployed four swiftwater rescue teams to Skagit and Snohomish counties. The Skagit and Samish rivers are forecast to crest at roughly 48 feet and 15 feet respectively, about 5 feet higher than their historic records, while the Nacelle River in southwest Washington has surged from 5 feet to nearly 20 feet in depth in just a few hours. With four rivers already in major flood stage and 11 more expected to join them, this is shaping up to be the most damaging flood event in western Washington since at least 1990, and the cost in property and infrastructure could run into the hundreds of millions once the waters recede. As of midnight on December 11th, the atmospheric river continues to pour moisture across western Washington. In the past 36 hours, rain gauges in the Cascades and Olympics have registered more than six inches of rainfall, and lowland towns like Mount Vernon and Bellingham have recorded nearly two inches with another one to three inches expected before the system weakens. River forecasts are evolving hourly. The Skagit River near Concrete is now predicted to crest near 48 feet around 4 a.m., about five feet above its previous record. In Mount Vernon, the same river is expected to crest near 42 feet at 4 a.m. Friday, which would also be a record. The Samish River near Burlington is projected to peak at 15 feet, roughly 3 feet higher than its historic high. As the water rises, roads and infrastructure are taking a beating. State highway officials report that sections of Interstate 5 have been closed intermittently due to standing water and debris slides, while U.S. Highway 20 is closed east of Burlington because of washouts and downed trees. Volunteers have filled tens of thousands of sandbags, but local officials warn that levees in Skagit County could suffer major damage if the forecast crests verify. Already, at least 18 people have been rescued from floodwaters along the Yakima Nachis and Sky Comish rivers, and emergency crews are pleading with residents not to drive through standing water. Governor Bob Ferguson has declared a statewide emergency, activated the National Guard, and requested an expedited federal disaster declaration. He says more than 300 Guard members will be in the region by Thursday afternoon to assist with rescue, sandbagging, and debris removal. The situation is fluid, but one thing is clear, the worst of this flood has yet to arrive. An atmospheric river is not just a poetic phrase, it is a scientific term for a narrow band of air that transports enormous amounts of water vapor from the tropics toward the poles. Picture a pipeline in the sky, on average it carries as much water vapor as the entire Mississippi River does in liquid form, and the strongest can carry up to 15 times that amount. When that pipeline makes landfall over mountains, the moisture cools and condenses, turning into days of torrential rain or heavy snow. In the American West, these rivers in the sky are responsible for roughly 80% of all flooding and cause more than $1 billion in damages each year. They are rated on a scale from AR1 to AR5, much like hurricanes. The current system over Washington is on the high end of that scale. As the atmosphere warms, its capacity to hold water increases, which means modern atmospheric rivers can be wider, wetter, and last longer than those of decades past. That is the meteorological side. On the ground, it means that what might have been a few days of steady drizzle becomes a wall of water. 
In places like Mount Vernon Everson and Sumas, residents talk about hearing the rain roaring on their roofs like it was a river above their heads. Tribal authorities with the Lummi Nation have declared a state of emergency as three of the four roads off their reservation are underwater. Volunteers in Everson line up in the dark to fill sandbags, while farmers near Linden worry about how long their livestock can stay on high ground. In Sumas Museum, workers race to move historical archives to the second floor, watching the watermark from a 2021 flood as the new crest rises past it. When people here talk about an atmospheric river, they are thinking about the school closures, the power outages, the sealed shop doors, the saturated fields, and the constant thrum of rain. It is a lesson that the most devastating storms in the Pacific Northwest do not arrive with names like hurricanes. They come quietly as rivers in the sky. Across western Washington, entire communities are adjusting to life alongside a river that now exists both in the sky and on the ground. In Skagit County, shop owners like Gabriel Mercado have stacked sandbags shoulder high at their doors and sealed the seams with duct tape, knowing that if the Skagit River overtops its flood wall, it will slap against their storefronts. Local pub worker and National Guard member Jeremy Holmes describes it simply, it's not a matter of if we flood, it's a matter of where and when. A flood's a flood and we just deal with them. Farmers who tend 70 head of cattle on 67 acres near Mud Lake spent Tuesday moving equipment and animals off low ground. In the afternoon, county officials closed non-essential services so emergency crews could focus on the flood response and the American Red Cross opened shelters for evacuees. On the east side of the county, sirens wailed through towns like Hamilton Concrete and Marble Mount as residents in level two get ready zones were told to prepare for a possible mandatory evacuation. By nightfall, parts of Mount Vernon were under a level three Chishgonau order. To the north in Whatcom County, the cities of Everson and Sumas sounded their flood sirens and urged people to leave before water cut off their escape routes. Museum volunteers in Sumas hurried to move photo albums and historical artifacts to the second floor while outside a line of cars stretched down the road as volunteers filled sandbags in the rain. Three of the four roads off the Lumi Reservation were underwater, prompting tribal leaders to declare a state of emergency and mobilize their own incident command system. In Bellingham, nearly 400 households lost power after equipment failed under the strain of the storm and parks like Hovander Homestead and Little Squalicum Pier were closed because of flooding and sinkholes. For these residents, an atmospheric river is not an abstract meteorological term. It is the reason their children are home from school, their businesses are closed, and their everyday routines are upended. What makes this flood feel so ominous is not just the volume of rain, but the conditions it fell upon. Western Washington entered December with rivers already running high from earlier storms and soils so saturated they could not absorb another drop. When a warm, moisture-laden plume of air arrived over the weekend, it poured straight onto hillsides and valleys that were already primed for runoff. In hydrology, the difference between a flood and a record flood often comes down to what came before it. Weeks of rain had filled the channels and reservoirs, so every additional inch of water went immediately into rivers. There is also the broader weather pattern. Meteorologists at the Climate Prediction Center note a mid-level ridge over the Bering Sea and a downstream trough over the northeastern Pacific that are acting together like rails for a train steering multiple atmospheric rivers toward the Pacific Northwest. Rather than one storm, this is a relay of storms. The current river in the sky is the first in a series forecast to arrive through mid-December. This means high water may not recede quickly, and the saturated soils will remain vulnerable to additional pulses of rain. In King County, wastewater officials have already reported overflows of combined sewage and stormwater into Lake Washington Salmon Bay, Portage Bay, and Elliott Bay and are urging residents to stay out of those waters for at least 48 hours to avoid illness. Dyke commissioners in Skagit County worry not only about overtopping, but about water seeping under levees that have been strengthened over the past 20 years. And King County's Department of Emergency Management warns that even wind speeds that wouldn't normally be a problem could topple trees in the soaked ground. All of these factors, saturated soils, already high rivers, multiple storms in a row, aging infrastructure, and even the timing of the tides combine to make this flood potentially more destructive than those of the past.
A generation ago, western Washington saw a catastrophic flood that displaced thousands of people, destroyed homes and bridges, and left two people dead with damages estimated at around $100 million. That 1990 event still lives in local memory. Yet the crest projections on the Skagit and Samish rivers tonight are higher than anything recorded then, and officials are using phrases like unthinkable and potentially catastrophic. This storm is part of a pattern that scientists say causes roughly 80% of flood events in the American West and more than $1 billion in damage each year. In other words, atmospheric rivers like this one may not have names like hurricanes, but they can rival them in impact. Even if you live thousands of miles from Washington State, this story matters. In an era of warmer oceans and shifting weather patterns, scientists note that atmospheric rivers are becoming longer, wetter, and more intense. The question is not whether they will keep coming, they will, but whether they will arrive when soils are saturated and rivers are already high, amplifying floods and landslides in ways that older residents never experienced. That is why what is unfolding in this corner of the United States is a warning for anyone living near a river, whether in Europe, Canada, or elsewhere in North America. So what happens next? Forecasts show that the rain will continue into Thursday, adding another inch or more in valley towns and several additional inches in the mountains. The Skagit River is now predicted to crest near 47 feet in the mountain town of Concrete early Thursday and around 41 feet in Mount Vernon early Friday, both several feet above previous records. County officials say they are confident in handling a normal flood, but this is no longer a normal flood. That uncertainty is why everyone in the 100-year floodplain has been told to pack a bag, move valuables upstairs, and be ready to leave before the river reaches their doorstep. When you look ahead, there are really three paths this story can take. In the best case, the rivers crest a little below the current forecast. There is still significant flooding, but levees hold water spreads mostly into fields and low-lying roads and damage while painful stays within what communities have seen before. The more likely scenario is that the rivers crest at or near the forecast. In that case, water will overtop some flood walls downtown areas like Mount Vernon, and towns along the Samish and Nooksack will see widespread inundation, and rescue crews will spend the night pulling people from stalled cars and flooded homes as they have already done along stretches of Interstate 5 and in neighborhoods with four feet of water inside the front door. The worst-case scenario is the one local officials once called unthinkable. The river's crest even higher than expected saturated hillsides give way. Levees fail in multiple places, and the map of what is considered safe ground has to be redrawn in real time. That is why the governor has declared a statewide emergency warned that lives will be at stake in the coming days and called in hundreds of National Guard members to help with evacuation, sandbagging, and search and rescue operations. Even if the region avoids that worst-case outcome in the next 24 to 48 hours, the threat does not disappear. Meteorologists are already tracking another storm system expected to arrive on Sunday, bringing yet another round of heavy rain. The overall pattern looks unsettled through the holidays, which means that high water may return before communities have time to fully recover from this first crest. With soil saturated rivers high and infrastructure strained, every new band of rain has the potential to trigger fresh flooding or landslides. In other words, what is happening this week in western Washington is not a single dramatic event. It is the beginning of a long, difficult stretch in which preparation, clear communication, and timely decisions will matter more than ever. When officials tell people to get ready or go, now it can sound like just another line in a press conference. On the ground, it is far more concrete. In towns along the Skagit Samish and Nooksack, families are pulling suitcases out from under beds, loading photo albums, medicines, and a few days' worth of clothes into the car and backing into their driveways so they can leave quickly if the word comes. Parents are explaining to children why they might sleep on a gym floor tonight instead of in their own rooms. Pet carriers are being pulled down from garage shelves. Gas tanks are topped off not for a weekend trip, but so no one is stranded on a flooded road with an empty tank. Emergency managers keep repeating a simple rule, do not wait until you see water at your doorstep. That is because the most dangerous minutes of a flood often come when people try to hang on for just a little longer. 
In Chahalas and along the Snohomish and Puyallup rivers, firefighters have already pulled drivers from stalled cars on submerged stretches of highway and helped families wade out of homes where the water reached over a meter deep inside. Hospitals and clinics have activated incident command plans, canceling non-urgent appointments so staff can focus on emergencies and, if necessary, move patients out of harm's way. Tribal governments, county sheriffs, and the National Guard are coordinating by radio and text matching high water rescue teams with the places where calls are most likely to come in. For those watching from outside Washington, it is worth imagining how this would look where you live. If a river near your home were forecast to reach record levels two days from now, what would you move first? Which road would you take if the main highway were underwater? Who in your family or neighborhood would need help to leave quickly? The scenes playing out tonight in Mount Vernon, Everson Sumas, and dozens of smaller communities are a real-time reminder that preparation is not an abstract checklist. It is a sequence of decisions made before the sky turns darker and the water reaches the last dry step. In the end, this story is about more than a single storm or a single state. An invisible river of moisture has turned into visible rivers of mud and brown water running through fields, streets, and living rooms. Western Washington is facing what may become one of the most significant flood events in its recent history, and yet the forces behind it are the same ones shaping weather on every coast warmer oceans, wetter storms, and fragile infrastructure built for a different climate. Tonight, the focus is on names like Skagit, Samish, Nooksack, Snohomish, and Chalice. But tomorrow, it could be a river in British Columbia, Bavaria, the Thames Valley, or the St. Lawrence. Wherever you live, if there is a river nearby, there is a version of this risk in your own backyard. There are a few lessons to carry away from what is happening in Washington right now. First, water almost always moves faster than we think. When forecasts show record crests one or two days out, that is the time to act, not to wait for confirmation at your doorstep. Second, communities that practice for floods before they happen cope better when they arrive. They know their routes, their shelters, their vulnerable neighbors. Third, clear, calm information saves lives. People do not need panic. They need to know when to pack, when to leave, and where to go. That is the mission of this channel, to take complex, fast-moving events and turn them into explanations you can trust, especially when the headlines are loud and confusing. If you live in a flood-prone area, let this be the moment you finally check your local flood map, assemble a simple go bag, and talk with your family about what you would do if the river near you behaved the way the Skagit is behaving tonight. Preparation made on a quiet day is the best protection on a noisy one. And if you want calm, data-driven coverage of atmospheric rivers, floods, volcanoes, and other natural hazards around the world, consider subscribing to this channel and turning on notifications. That way, when the next river in the sky points at a populated coastline, you will have clear, verified information ready before the water starts to rise.